Song of Solomon, chapter number 4, and verse number 15. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, and verse 15. You'll also find it referred to in some references as the canticles, the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs, it'll also be called. It is the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter number 4, and verse number 15. Scripture says, A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come, thou south. Blow up on my garden, and that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Father, bless this holy word now as it goes forth. Anoint this messenger today to give it forth, Father. In your holy name, amen. You can be seated. The Song of Solomon is a beautiful book, folks. A lot of folks read the Song of Solomon and all can think about is sex because they're preoccupied with that. You live in a culture today, the average American, from the time he gets up in the morning till he goes to bed at night, thinks about sex. I saw a 38 special the other day. This guy was talking about it, Smith & Wesson 38 special. Nice weapon. He said that was sexy. There's nothing sexy about a 38 special. Nothing whatsoever. But the idea is that he equates anything he or she sees to that. That's what happens when you're preoccupied with something. The Song of Solomon goes much deeper than something like that. The Song of Solomon has a great message in it, and it's something that we need to learn. Scripture says the Shulamite is talking about the winds blowing upon her garden. Now, it's important to understand that the garden of the Lord is where God started with Adam, but the garden of the Lord is located in what's called a waste howling wilderness. The moment you walk out of this house today, you're walking into a wilderness. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was baptized in the Jordan River, he went into the wilderness for the next 40 days. The wilderness, therefore, represents the world and all that's in the world. No garden, nothing but stench, nothing but dead, nothing but that which is passing away. But the garden of the Lord is something that he planted something personal. By the way, every last one of you in this house today, if you're born again, you are a planting of the Lord. Amen. Scripture says, by the rivers of water. And therefore, he has put you here for a reason. And when he looks upon your soul, he sees something entirely different than what he sees in the world. Psalm chapter 104 says in verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great, Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who covers thyself with light because he is light, but the only way you can see him is for him to give you something you can see, as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, and walk caref watch carefully, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. We were talking about the wings of the wind. When we talk about the threshing floor, did you know the threshing floor is a place of separation? There are three things that are important about it. The winnower, the chaff, and the wheat. The winnower is the one who tosses it up into the air, and the wind does the separating, and therefore the chaff is blown away, and the wheat remains. The wheat remains because it has substance to it. It has weight to it. The Bible says that the wicked are like the foaming, or the sea, the wild, carried away, no substance to them whatsoever. You can't count on them. They're here today. They're gone tomorrow. Their life is just simply a vapor, and, and they are soon forgotten, and people even forget that they even lived. But the Bible says, the Scripture teaches us that the memory of the wicked shall rot. So that's tough to think that the time is going to come when you won't even know they ever existed. But you, you're the planting of the Lord. And wind is associated with man in a very special way. And wind is also a type of the Holy Ghost of God. The Holy Spirit is associated as a type of, throughout all the Bible, the wind. So the winner, whoever it might be, depending on the time, the element, is the one who tosses up into the air. And the wind, the Holy Ghost, does the separating. The wind blows the chaff away and the wheat falls to the ground. So the truth of the matter is that if you're born again today, the wind is your friend. Amen. 
The wind, the Holy Ghost, is your friend. He's not your enemy. If you're not born again today, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit can be a scorching, burning wind that comes into your life and you're unable to sustain yourself in the presence of it. But compare the threshing floor with the sieve or the sieve. So what is that? Well, it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, I'd like him praying for me too, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. The sifting is done with a sieve. What does that mean? Here's how it works. The wind has nothing to do with it. The sifting has to do with one who takes in his hand and he shakes. He shakes. The Egyptians have engraved in their stone winnowers and the shakers. In other words, you put into the, in the crucible of the devil and it begins to shake. And so what comes forth from that? Well, he destroys all that's in it. There's nothing left. He wants to sift you. He wants to take even that which is the grain and reduce it to nothing where there's nothing good left whatsoever. And so he begins to shake. Some of you in this house today, you're being shaken right now. Amen. He's trying to sift you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to ruin you. He walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And make no mistake about it, when Satan's finished with you, there's nothing but a skeleton left of what you had once been. That which inside you was good, that was bringing forth fruit by the power of the Holy Ghost, is now empty and dead and vain. He has a lot of different ways to shake, but don't have time to get into the day because i got a lot more to follow this. But make no mistake about it, the wind is your friend. The Holy Ghost helps you. He comes into your life and he works a wonderful, marvelous work upon you. But if Satan gets a hold of you, make, make, understand this today, he begins to shake you. And he begins to shake your very foundation, to shake you as to who you are. It is certain that you must walk in the Spirit, therefore. You must walk in the Spirit, therefore. And when you walk in the Spirit, you walk in the light. If you're not walking in the Spirit and walking in the light, you're stumbling in darkness. And there's no in-between. You're either walking in the light or you're stumbling in darkness. If you follow your own intuitions, your own understandings, your own direction, your own gurus and teachers and whatever you think life is about, you're stumbling and you're in darkness and you don't have a clue where you're headed. But therefore, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanseth, is cleansing, constantly cleansing you from all sin. That's a wonderful thing. Amen. So every place that God cleanses, that he purges, that he takes from your life, every last place that he does, he replaces that with the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Think about that. Meditate on that for a moment. When he purges you, cuts from you that which is wrong, it is not right, it is not, it is not of the Holy Spirit of God. When he comes into your life, my dear friend, and begins to purge you. He purges you to make you better so that the good can grow, so that it can take place, so it can replace that which was there. And my friend, he'll always replace whatever he takes from you with Christ. Not what Christ can do for you, who Christ is to you. Now meditate on that for a moment. A lot of people today are concerned about, what, well, what can the Lord do for me? He'll give you Christ, and with the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the gift of God. You have the wisdom of God. You've got the riches of heaven. You've got everything that you could possibly need in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen to the Shulamite. She says, O fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, streams from Lebanon, Awake, O north wind, come, thou south, blow up on my garden, that the spices there above may flow out. In plainer words, send the Holy Ghost, that he may come and blow upon this garden. The east wind in the Bible is a bad wind. It's a devastation. The Bible teaches us in Genesis chapter number 41, verse 6, that Pharaoh had a dream. And Joseph interpreted that dream and said that the wind from the east would blow. And it would smite the food, and it did. In Exodus chapter number 10, when Moses' rod was lifted, an east wind brought the locust and purge upon Egypt. Job 27, verse 21, an east wind carries the wicked away. The wind's direction is important in the scripture. In the book of Jonah, chapter number 4 and verse 8, you remember Jonah, the one who ran from God? Are you running from him today? Where are you hiding? 
What do you, you think God can't see you? Think he doesn't know? Think he doesn't understand? Do you think he doesn't know where you're headed next? Job was running for, or Jonah was running from God. Chapter number four and verse eight, and an east wind beat down upon his head. A west wind is a wind of deliverance. It took the locust away from Egypt in Exodus 10. If you'll remember when Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, what direction did he look to see that hand? Where was he looking to see that hand as it arose and said, now the, wind, now the rain of God is coming? Why, he saw it in the Mediterranean. Which direction do you look to see the Mediterranean? From where You look west, and that's where the deliverance was brought from. The north wind is a wind of clearing. And the Bible says in Job 37, cold cometh from the north. Then fair weather cometh from the north, and it driveth away the rain. With clouds you have rain, but the clouds cover the sun. And so when the wind comes and blows them away, every once in a while God will bring some sunlight into your life. And you'll see some glory from above. We need that. We need it greatly. We need that touch of God. The south wind is a wind of pleasantness. It says in Job chapter 37, Elihu said, it quieteth the earth. So the wind comes from the south. The Shulamite said, thereof may flow out. How do you smell in the nostrils of God? Can you smell the spirit? I'm talking about spiritually speaking. Can you sense the spirit you're around? Do you know what's around you? Oh, preacher, I heard him say this and I heard him say that. Winston Churchill said this. He says, I no longer listen to anything that people say. He said, I watch what they do. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. Watch what they do. Watch what they do. Not what they say. The Bible says plainly, a tree is judged by the fruit it bears. Watch the fruit. Give it time. And you'll find out the spirit that's around you. She knows the value of the Holy Spirit and his presence and power. The Holy Spirit, my friend, is absolutely necessary. He said in John 15, without me, ye can do nothing. Now we can have good organization. We can have good entertainment in the churches. Some of them, my dear friend, for the first 45 minutes, it's a mosh pit down in the front. They're jumping up and down. The lights are flashing. The big screens are moving across the wall. They got every kind of a rock band you can think of. They get them all worked up, jumping up, jumping up, jumping up. And then for the next 10 or 15 minutes, somebody sits down on a stool and gives them a little bit of feel-good sermon, and they think they've been to church. Now, how many of you know that's going on today? Amen. That's not the church of God. What you saw this morning is the church of God. People who believe the Bible, who believe in the Lord, and who love the Lord. But the Holy Spirit's important. You can't see him. You can't see him. He's invisible. The Lord said, Nicodemus, the wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof. You canst not tell from whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit of the living God. So the Lord Jesus Christ made a direct connection between the Holy Ghost and the wind. And you can't tell. You don't know. It, and you can't call it down either because that's something that comes forth from God. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, the spirit moved upon the virgin. The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as the mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. A spirit being brought a physical being into this world. Amen. Meditate on that for a moment. He became a man in the womb of the virgin. God and man merged, and that was by the power of the Holy Ghost, and it was not done biologically the way we do things. You need to understand that. If, you're, if, you, are, if you are enamored with sex from the Song of Solomon, then you don't have a clue what's going on. Life, my dear friend, came from God, and it came from God the way God brings it. The Holy Ghost always brings life. And without him is nothing but death. He moved over the Savior at his baptism. He said, this is my son. This is my beloved son. I'm well pleased with him. And he was anointed of the Holy Spirit and he went into the wilderness. Luke chapter 4, he returned from the wilderness after 40 days. And he was walking in the power of the Spirit of God. He walked in the power into Galilee. And there was a fame that went out through him all the regions round about. He was anointed with power. This is the beginning of his ministry. The Lord Jesus Christ would not step forth even though he was the second person of the Trinity. 
He had the power, my dear friend, to do anything. He could say the word and stop anything. He could create while he was here. But no, my dear friend, he became a man. And my dear friend, he subjected himself to God and he subjected himself to his mother and his, and his, and his stepfather, as best you could call him. He, he subjected himself to them. He became subject to them because he was now a man. But everything he did, he did by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. We ought to, as the church of the living God, do whatever it takes in our lives to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Wherever you find a hindrance to the Holy Ghost in your life, deal with it. Face on. Amen. 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 He was anointed with power, power to follow the Holy Ghost, power to follow the Spirit, power to enter the wilderness, power to seek the will of God, power to commune with God, power to discern the Scripture, and power to take authority over Satan. Good Baptists don't believe in that. Let me tell you something now. This might move you and shake you up. I told someone this yesterday, the day before, I forget who it was, when, but I said, you take all the Baptists and you take the Methodists and you take the Presbyterian, you take the Catholic and the Episcopalian and you take the Charismatics and the Pentecostals, you take every one of them and you put them all together and throw them out the door and take that Bible and say, God, teach me your word. Teach me that book. Say, are you anti-Baptist? No, I'm a Baptist, but I also know the Baptist. And that book right there is God's word. The Baptists are not God's word because I hear Baptists all the time contradicting that book to, su to support one of their pet doctrines. This book is God's word, dear friend. That's his word. I'm a Bible believer. Amen. I believe the book. So I'm really, I believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit moved at the cross. Hebrews 9, 14 said, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Note carefully, the death of Christ was by the Holy Ghost of God. That's what it says. Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. What does that mean? That means that the Lord Jesus Christ said, My Father, you've forsaken me at the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Heaven is dark to me. My and would the Lord Jesus Christ said, look at them, they're mocking me, making fun of me. They're cursing me. Everything possible could happen to me. I've done exactly what you said to do, though, Lord. Yeah. I've been obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Here I am upon the tree, and now there's nowhere else for me to go. There's nothing else for me to do. There's nothing else for me to say. Yeah. Father, into thy hands yeah. I come in my spirit. And my dear friend, the father now had received the one of all that ever lived who was absolutely and completely and totally obedient to him. And he received him. And through the, and through the eternal spirit, he offered himself without spot to God. He moved upon the tomb in Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. The spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. The Holy Ghost raised him up. Well, God the father raised him up. He raised himself up. But you see in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There are times that you can differentiate between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And there are times that you cannot. Amen. 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 And then he moved over the throne. The Bible said in Mark chapter number 12, And Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the Son of God? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. So the Holy Spirit, my friend, that offered him up is the one who made him, not made, but let him sit down at the right hand of the Father. Listen to the scriptures. The apostle says in Ephesians 1:20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Then he moves over the sinner. John chapter 16, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will convince the world convicted of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And that's exactly what he's doing today. This is what Satan hates 
more than anything there is. And to the man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. To the man, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And to the man, he breathed the wind of Pentecost. And they received power from on high. And that's what we need in the church of God. Satan, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I know you and I know you well. I have battled you for a long time. You think that you are overpowering and winning right now, but I'm going to bring you under the blood of Christ at this very moment. I come against thee in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ, Satan. You don't own me. You cannot take from me what was freely given to me at the cross. I know whom I have believed. I know you despise me. I know that. But I am victor over you, and you know I am. And in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ this morning, Satan, I listen, Satan, listen. I, Christ rebuke you. In the name of Jesus, he rebuke you. And move from this house and move from this place. For I know what you're trying to do. And you will not win. You will not be victor. I come against you in the name of Jesus. Satan, you know. In thy name I pray, Lord Jesus. And for thy sake I ask it. How do you know you're listening to the Holy Ghost? How do you know? First of all, you love Christ. You have a love for him. Amen. Amen. Well, I love the church. Well, don't put your stock in the church. I love people. Don't put your faith in people. I love the ministry. Don't put your faith in the ministry. Well, then what do I put my faith? Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ will never fail you. He'll never let you down. He'll never, ever, ever, ever leave you. He'll always be everything that you need to be able to do what God's called you to do. How do you know you love him? You think about him. Are you thinking about him? Do you really do you really think about the Lord Jesus Christ? Fanny Crosby said in her songbook, I think of him all the day long. Yeah. Fanny Crosby loved our Lord Jesus Christ, and did he ever give her a gift, that gift of song? You want his name projected, not yours. I don't care, my dear friend, whether you know me or not. I'm so tired of preachers carrying all their medals around and all of their titles and all of this. And all. Listen, dear friend. I've been in the hospital at death's door. I've been in there when death came in. I've been through the darkest of the dark. I've been through the valleys of the shadow of death time and time and time again. Do you know what? I never hear the name of some great preacher when I go into these places, but I hear the name of Jesus. Oh, yes, I hear that name over and over and over. I hear the name of Jesus. Yes, sir. Have you ever been through the valley of the shadow of death? Do you really know what I'm talking about today? Have you walked up to the casket and looked down at a son or a daughter, a husband, wife, mother, father? Have you been what I'm talking about? You're not thinking about some great preacher. You're thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. For he's the one and his voice that will raise the dead. Hallelujah to God. The hour is coming when all that are in the graves shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. He's everything or he's nothing. He's all there is or there is nothing. And he is to me my soul, my spirit, my life, my being, my inspiration. That's why I preach. That's why I'm here. That's why I'll be here till he gets ready to call me home. One more time this morning I said to him, Lord, just let me live as long as you want me to live. But Lord, please, as long as I'm in this world, let me have my mind and let me be able to preach your word and minister the word of God. And then when you're done with me, you're done with me. Take me out of this place. I'll be ready to go. Maybe this is my last message. If it is, I'll meet you by the river. Amen. Amen. Some glorious day. Satan doesn't like that. Did you hear who I was talking to a minute ago? That was not pre, I didn't pre-plan to do that. But I know hell when it shows up. I've been there. I've seen it. I've been right there face to face with it, friend. I'm no novice. I've been at this a long time. And he hates this church. But he will not have this church. And he will not destroy it. In the name of Jesus, I come against you, Satan. You cannot have. This is the body of Christ. Amen. <laughs> Amen. If Christ is being manifest in your life, you can be sure the Holy Ghost is working in you. So how do you know he's manifesting? You'll see a change in your life. 
Now, I want to talk personally. Please listen to me. I believe God's given me a little bit of wisdom for the few years I've been in this world. The scripture in the book of Galatians talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And people then said about, well, I'm going to keep the commandments and that I'm going to do right and I'm going to show the love of God and I'm going to this and I'm going to, you're not going to do anything. You don't have the power to create the love of God. You don't have the ability to create any of the fruit of the Spirit. That's not in us. Well, then how does it happen? It happens when you open up and start walking in light and start walking in communion and fellowship of the Lord and let him begin to move out the old man, begin to purge and raise you up and the Holy Ghost begins to work through you. The Holy Spirit begins to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. My dear friend, that's the truth and that's the scripture that you don't have it in yourself to do what I'm talking about, nor do I, nor does anyone. The fruit of the Spirit is the work of the Spirit. And if you're not born again, it'll never happen because he's not in you. The Holy Ghost is not working in your life, and some of you know it. You don't pray. I got cheated out of my prayer yesterday morning. Got up and it's raining. I really got mad, tell you the truth. I have to confess it. Got mad because every morning this past week, I've been able to go out there 4, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning and talk to God. There's something about praying outside that's different than praying with a roof over your head. Now, you can pray in here. No, you can pray in here. Don't misunderstand me. But boy, do I like to go out there and look up at those stars and breathe that air and know there's nothing over the top of my head and look up to God. I just love it. I love being outside praying. You ought to try it sometime. But here's the thing. If you have no desire to pray, you may be keeping all the commandments you know to keep. You may be reading your Bible every day. You may have your devotionals. And all these are all good things. You may have all the stuff you can pile up around you. You may, be, you may, you may involve yourself in all the good works you can think of. You can give and do and give and do and give and do. But the truth of the matter is your prayer life's dead. You know why it's dead? You may be mumbling something to God, but God's not talking back to you. Once he ever begins to commune with you, he'll set your soul on fire. Amen. Amen. And some of you this morning, that's what you need. That's what you need. You need your prayer life living again. The scripture becomes boring and dead to you. This is not a boring book. Let me tell you what's boring. One preacher hears another preacher, and he likes his outline, he preaches it. Another preacher hears that preacher's outline, he preaches it. First thing you know, 15 preachers down the line preaching the same thing, and it's, it's 50 miles wide and a quarter of a mile deep. Shallow as it can be. And most of the preaching today that comes out of the pulpits, in this country at least, is feel good, positive, make you feel good about yourself preaching. And there's times in the Bible you need to feel good, but there's times in the Bible that you need to see yourself as God sees you. Because you see, when the Holy Ghost is working in your life, he begins to show you what you're made out of, who you are. He communicates with you. And don't ever make the mistake of thinking that just because today that everything's just fine and you fully understand who you are, you really don't. It'll take a long time for the Holy Ghost to unfold who you really are but he'll do it to purge who you are to cleanse who you are remember for everything he takes away he replaces it with Christ with the Lord Jesus and what you thought you understood today you'll find out a week from now that he may get a little deeper into your life he may reach down in there now here's the key and I'll come to a close here's the key Here's what's wrong with most people. They tell God what they think God wants to hear. They put on this religious facade when they get in there and they start praying and they start whatever they've heard somebody else say. That's what they say. And they think that's the way you talk to God. Let me tell you how to talk to God. People that have never talked to God and get saved do better talking to God than people who have been in church for 30 years. Because they don't know any better. They just start talking to God. And you know what? God hears them. Amen. Well, now, does God really know everything that's going on? No, he, he already knows everything that's going on. 
He just wants you to agree with him when he begins to move in your soul. This is what's important about talking to God. Honesty. 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 Well, Lord, I did this because I didn't have any better sense. All right. I did this because I was mad. All right. I did this because I didn't like that person. All right. I did this over here because, so, you know, I, I was a little greedy, Lord. Really was. All right. I did this over here because I let the flesh get a hold of me, and I, I didn't realize I had that much flesh left in me. Oh, yeah, you got plenty of flesh left in you. Well, I did this because so-and-so did that to me, all right? Here's the thing. You're honest. You're talking to God. Not hiding nothing. Well, you say, well, God can't handle it. No, 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 no. You're the one that can't handle it. God can handle anything. God can handle anything. I want to tell you something. I'm not working miracles, but I want to tell you something. If you would come down here this morning and get on your knees and start talking to God the way you know you should be talking to him, talking to him about what's deep, deep, deep down inside your soul as he brings it out, he's not going to run you off. He's not going to condemn you. That's not to condemn you. Satan's the condemner. That's to help you. If you let him talk to you and you listen to him and you talk back to him and you confess what he said to you, you will be amazed at how your prayer life and your walk with God becomes to open up all of a sudden and you'll feel a freedom that you haven't felt in a long time. You'll know he heard you and you'll know you heard him. And you know, here's, here's, here's the benefit of all that, the joy of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. You didn't win, Satan. Amen. Holy Ghost came in here and they listened. You're not going to stop God's work. You're not going to do it. In the name of Jesus. And for Jesus' sake, I pray. Now I ask you, why don't you come down here and talk to him? Nobody's going to count heads. Nobody's going to count put numbers on the wall. Nobody's going to meet tomorrow at the, at, the, at the preacher's meeting and brag about how many we had in church or how many prayed. I don't do that. I don't belong. I, don't, I have nothing to do with that crowd. All I want to do today is help you. I want to help you, dear friend. Why don't you come down here this morning? You know you need to. You know you need And you, listen, let me tell you something else, too. You don't have to confess to me. You don't have to confess to some man. No, no, this is between you and God. Amen. This is very personal between you and the Lord. And keep it that way, and you'll find your spiritual life much better off. When you confess it, you confess it the Almighty, not a man. Would you come? Just come on down. Let's pray. I'll pray with you. I'll pray with everybody that comes down here. I want to pray. I love to pray. When I get to where I can't pray, I know I'm in trouble. I need to pray. I need to be able to pray. I need to talk to the Lord. And I went out this morning, and it was wet, and it hadn't been raining. And I said, I don't care if I get soaked, I'm going to pray. So I sat down on my, on my back porch, and I had my prayer. And I praise God for it. Amen. Talk to the Lord. There's no better way to start your day, dear friend, than to talk to the Lord. Amen. How, have, how many of you ever been out there early enough to hear the first bird when it starts chirping? Look at these hands going up. See this? I'm not the only one that does that. Look at these hands all over the place. You hear that first one. Then the others begin to chime in. When that first one, I heard the first one today. It was on my right-hand side. It started over there, and then they started. Birds start singing. I say, who are they singing to? Who do you think they're singing to? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for these dear souls that have come forth and for those who know they need to. And maybe they're timid. I don't know, Lord, you know. All the things keep somebody from moving. That's, that's, not my, that's not my issue. My, I've done what you've told me to do. But Heavenly Father, I pray of all things, the most important thing this morning is that they learn how to be honest with you. Honest. If, they, if, they've, if they've thought something, done something, if something's happened to them, they can't handle it, they, don't have, they have no explanation, don't understand it, just teach them that simply bring it to you. Bring it to you. Tell you about it. And then listen to you. And see you how, begin you how you begin to move in their lives. That's what's important about this today, Lord. You want to talk to them. 
You want to talk to us? Lord, we pray. Oh, God, how Satan hates that. He despises that. He can't stand the thought that somebody could pray and get strength from the Lord and be filled with the Holy Ghost. But bless them, Father. Bless them now. Bless every one of them. Lord, we're in here to help people today, not to condemn them, kick them down. We're here to help them. And that's what this message is all about. It's about helping in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Brother, Brother McDonald, lead us, lead us in something.